Now it's time. I did that already. David is an executive in the healthcare industry, still involved. He's a retired executive, but he's still involved in healthcare. He's got his own consulting firm. He's still on local boards, the Cardiac Innovative Institute at UofL, Passport Health, Jewish Heritage Fund for Excellence, Bowling Green, WKU, the Gatton Academy and Gifted Studies, Ford Business School. Let's give David a warm welcome to our club. He's only going to have enough time to be here every other Thursday. And a Paul Harris fellow and a bunch of other stuff. Okay. Thanks, President. All right. Thank you, President Barry and fellow Rotarians, distinguished guests, colleagues, and our newest member, David Laird. It is a great pleasure and honor to get to introduce to you all, oh my goodness, Teddy Abrams. Teddy Abrams is a genius. Teddy Abrams is a virtuoso. Teddy Abrams was a child prodigy, and rumor has it when they tried to load up someone on Wikipedia, or Wikipedia, everything he had done, every country he's performed or composed in, every city that he's gone to, every conductor experience he's had, it crashed. So your phones will not be working during the remainder of the lunch, so please do not pull them out. So what I'm going to do, instead of giving you the laundry list of all the places Teddy has been and the great things he's done and the world premieres that we have because he has lived and he walks among us, I'm going to tell you a few things about Teddy you might not know. At three years of age, he was composing. At eight years of age in his elementary school in California, he told me that they were going to have a band. And when he walked into the band room where all the shiny instruments were, he told me that he wanted that one. And, it, and I said, what was it? And he said, that's a saxophone. And because he had heard they're really cool and you can do great things with them. Here's what happened. Teddy Abrams walked over there and asked the band director if he could have that one. And so he picked it up. Ah, some decisions get made for you in life. Teddy's hands wouldn't fit around that saxophone at eight years of age. So that loving band director looked at that sad little boy and he picked up a clarinet and by God, the rest is history. Because one of the greatest clarinetists in the world is gonna step to this podium in just a moment. What I really want you to know about Teddy Abrams is not only was he a child prodigy in terms of music, Teddy dropped out of school. That's the way I like to tell the story, Teddy. When he was 11 years of age, now think about it. If your child or grandchild dropped out of school at 11 years of age, what would you do? Now how did that happen? Because when he was nine, his mom and dad took him to an outdoor concert, just like we used to get to go to at the Louisville Zoo and listen to the beloved Louisville Orchestra. And Teddy went home that night and wrote out a multi-page letter at nine years of age to Michael Tilson Thomas, the conductor of the San Francisco Symphony. And it went something like this. Oh, the music was great and it was wonderful and my parents took me, but I watched you and you look like you were in charge of everything, so I want to be in charge of everything. And the rest is history. And so Teddy then started working and studying with Michael Tilson Thomas, and then the message was given to his parents, this child must drop out of school, so to speak. So he started taking classes at that age at the community college. And Teddy Abrams graduated from middle school, high school, and college at the, year, at the age of 18 years of age with a bachelor's in music. So as he begins to make his way up to the podium to join me, if you will, Teddy, watch how this young man moves. He rides a bicycle everywhere he goes. He used to carry that keyboard around on the bicycle until I think there was a wreck and he broke 12,000 bones in his body or something like that. And then Teddy went on conducting. If you missed the magazine article recently about Teddy, he is also, as you can see, a fashion aficionado. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Teddy Abrams. Wow. I think that, uh, well, I've heard about you, you undersell something and over deliver. Barbara, I'm concerned. That was the most dramatic introduction I think I've ever gotten. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I hope I, I, hope I can uh, quasi deliver. But it's so great to be back here uh, at the Rotary and uh, 
to, to share some music and to, to speak with you and also just to uh, express my own appreciation for everything that you all do. I know this is a group that cares so deeply about the community. That's why you're here. That's why you get involved with an organization like the Rotary because you, you believe uh, in the power of, of people coming together to make a difference. And I know that these things can sound like platitudes. They can sound like things that we repeat over and over and over, make a difference. Uh, and especially in the world of music, we often say, oh, the language of music is universal. It's the universal language. We repeat this stuff over and over, and, and, and it feels good to say it, uh, but it kind of becomes a, a bit of a campaign slogan to the point that sometimes you forget that there, there is an underlying truth to these sayings, to making a difference, to using the language of music, which is the universal language, to make a difference. Uh, and I often like to just, just remind ourselves that, that there are these powerful truths and, and great histories and wonderful stories that have led us to, to these moments of, of coming together to, to share. Uh, and I loved also in the, the invocation to that mention of, of the power of, of this art form uh, that, that we're going to be talking about just a little bit. And uh, you could talk about it endlessly because there are so many ways to, to look at music. It has uh, both implications just as a pure entertainment, but it also has social histories. It has stories that relate even to the, the history of, of our city, and I could get into that. I actually might share a little, little story around that just to demonstrate how powerful this language is. I was originally asked, though, to talk about uh, corporate philanthropy, which is a, a slightly different kind of topic. And, uh, it, and, and I thought, well, obviously, I have a very captive audience uh, uh, right here, many of whom are involved either in the corporate world or the, uh, perhaps in, in some way, shape, or form the uh, philanthropic side of things. But that, that also didn't seem quite right just to uh, take advantage of that situation, but maybe to, to use some of the stories of how music has come to be to illustrate where we, we all might go uh, into the future. And of course, remembering that all the music that, that we love has to come from, from somewhere. It has to come from, obviously, somebody's mind. It has to come from something that they, they dream up. But ultimately, it's not made for four walls. It's not made for just the spaces around them. It's made to signify something that ultimately can't be expressed in, in any other way about how it feels to be alive and what the world is, is like around us. And you know, I was looking at, at some, some pieces of music that, that I might share and just thinking about some of the, the most basic elements here. I want to play you just at the beginning of this, this Beethoven sonata. Uh, and you know, when we, I'm going to blend my corporate philanthropy speech with Beethoven because you often think of Beethoven as being this defiant, you know, maybe kind of difficult uh, uh, individual who just made music happen. That's, that's kind of how we think about, about Beethoven. Uh, but actually, Beethoven was a, a, a shrewd business person. He understood that the relationship between the leaders in the community and music making had to be very tight. Uh, and so you look at virtually any single piece by Beethoven, and there will be somebody that he dedicated this, this piece to. And Beethoven was always working every possible angle. He was fundraising for his own concerts. Uh, he was soliciting donations from princes and archdukes. There are a lot of princes. This one's for Prince Franz von uh, Brunswick. Uh, and and it's, it's really an amazing intertwining of relationships that, that continues to this day. But I just want to play you the, the very beginning of, of this, this work by, by Beethoven. And uh, I'm not going to say anything more than just, just playing the, the opening. play it like that, I didn't give you any context whatsoever. I didn't tell you anything about that piece. But judging from the fact that you still appear to be staring in this direction, uh, you must have heard something. Something must have happened to you while you were listening to that. 
And I'm kind of curious to know what, that they, in a slightly rhetorical fashion, because I don't think we have time to go and share all of our feelings. And one of the best things about music is in fact that we don't have to share them out loud. You are able to have that direct relationship with what was just played without having to verbalize how you felt about it, without me needing to verbalize how you should feel about it. You can simply sit there and enter into a dialogue, a communion with a person that never spoke our language, not our, our verbal language, and never even imagined a world like the one we have around us. And so if I just take the very beginning melody and I ask you just to try and figure out what's going on right here. So much information was just brought up, information that you have experienced your entire lives. This background of musical data, this background of social data, memories from hearing minor chords. You've heard millions of minor chords, F minor right there. You know exactly what that means to you because you know how you felt when you heard minor chords. It also actually implies certain brain functions just by sending this data into your ears. It forces you to react a certain way that is truly universal. And on top of that, your brain is actively engaged in trying to track the information that's going on. You're not just letting it wash over you like I put some kind of, you know, um, you know, smell-o-vision situation. And it's not like that at all. It's not just a sensation. You're actually tracking it as language. And you recognize that when I went from note one to note two to note three, I was going right back up the way I came when I continue to play the next part of the phrase. And you recognize that as being an arpeggio. Perhaps it recalls something that you did as a young person in your early piano practicing. Perhaps it recalls something that you heard as the background to a hip hop song. Perhaps it recalls something that you just experienced while passing a, a moving car that was listening to music. These memories were all entered into your being and stay with you for life. It's for that very simple reason that in fact, music has this power to connect us all. And the really cool thing about music is that the way that that works on your brain is pretty much universal. Uh, it's not specific to your culture. It's not specific to the time in which you live. Beethoven's time produced the same brain reactions to music that our time produces right now. And that is what gives it this power. Uh, and it w it's what gives it this ability to transcend our, our backgrounds. And I think about this a lot as a, 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 an arts leader. I, I, I guess that's a, that is a, a role uh, that, that I play here in, in town. You know, nobody goes into conducting to uh, raise money. They, unless, that, unless you really had a, a love for fundraising and development, actually it's a great way if you want to get into the development game to conduct. Nobody kind of goes in thinking that they're going to be in marketing. Uh, nobody goes in thinking that they're going to be giving speeches. Most musicians are more comfortable using music as the form of communication. Uh, but one of the things that I recognized when I took on this role here in town is that we have the opportunity to become a a real world leader in how we not only make music, but use our music to connect people. And I look out at, at Louisville and I see this amazing place where people, they want the very best here for their city. I think we all want the very best for our city uh, in, in a way that we can dream up a future that's going to be tremendously exciting. And this is where art comes into play. That an orchestra, through its vision, an orchestra through thinking way outside the box, thinking big, can actually start using this universal element of, of Beethoven, of music that was written yesterday, of music that's going to be written into the future, to bring all the folks that live amongst us together. Uh, and, and I mean that very, very genuinely. And I think that's, if, if art serves any one purpose, it's going to be that. And the great philanthropy uh, uh, families, the philanthropic families and corporations and all the, the people that have supported art now for centuries of the human experience, I think have, have recognized that. Uh, whether you go back to the Medici's that thought that in their city, 
people should live amongst beautiful things, that artists that were dreaming up and creating things that would inspire or transcend should put their art in places where everybody can access it. That is a very modern idea, but it was something that, that created uh, a culture that not only had tremendous strength in that association with it, but also has given it its lasting definition. Uh, and that continues to, to this very day. It's the same thing that Rockefellers and, and Carnegie's dreamed up when they recognized that their role in, in American society would be in about, uh, about bringing a balance to not only the great wealth that they accumulated, but creating the potential society that you could dream up. And it's related to our history. Rockefeller's money eventually funded the Louisville Orchestra. I don't know if you are aware of that, but Rockefeller uh, ended up giving, gi giving uh, the, the Louisville Orchestra $500,000 about 60 years ago, which is a tremendous amount of money. And it was specifically designed to get the Louisville Orchestra to play new music, to commission new music, to record new music, and distribute it all throughout the world. It was an effort to put the town of Louisville on the map in a way that it hadn't been for people to look at this city and say, that is a forward-leading, incredibly vibrant, artistic community. And it's really interesting when you think that ultimately uh, people from the background of the Rockefellers would have been funding the orchestra here in this city that has given us our background story that we use as a kind of rallying cry to this very day. I go around talking about that story because it serves as a tremendous basis for what we can accomplish in, in the future. Uh, anyway, now to take a short little break from uh, the discussion here, I thought I would actually play you a little bit more music. And this tune right here uh, is actually a song that I wrote. It's kind of a peppy tune. It has no other title except it's called Jazz. And whenever I'm giving s speeches, I'm just you know, reminded of the, of the fact that music is ultimately what I've chosen to do with my life. As Barbara said, I fell in love with this art form from the time that I saw it played live outside in public at that concert by the San Francisco Symphony. And I recognized that that was a free service that was put out there for the community because people deserve access to great art. And since then, I've been completely uh, uh, devoted this is, it's, it's like a, a monk-like kind of uh, uh, life that you lead uh, when, you, when you believe in the power of this, this art form. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a two-way street. It's bringing music from the past or the present that other people have conceived to life, but it's also creating your own. Uh, and one of the things that I love to do is to blend styles of music together that often would not be uh, uh, associated with each other, taking elements of classical and popular and jazz and funk or even hip hop and rap uh, and folk and all these things and talking about how the music can coexist in one single space and be uh, truly unified and, and united. So this is, this is hopefully a little, a little example.
Yes, that's just a little, a little tune. So uh, anyway, as, as I was saying, you, you know, the world of music is very, very broad, and the things that we can do with it are pretty much endless. And if I was to kind of describe what the orchestra does on a daily basis to try and make music something that everybody can access, everybody can have a relationship with, it would be a big laundry list. And our vision is very broad. And if I was to kind of lay out the, the vision for Louisville, uh, and I, I, I know this is not, this, it's not a political speech, it can often sound like I'm trying to run for something, uh, although it's, it's really, it, I always describe the arts as just one evergreen, continuous cycle of elections. We never actually have the election, we just keep on campaigning over and over and over again. Would you like that, Barbara? Would that, that, does that sound like fun? Anyway, here's, here's what it is. I don't talk about being the best orchestra in the world. That's a very silly thing. I don't know what that means. Best? Uh, I don't know. What, what makes it better than another one? Most people honestly can't tell whether or not the, you know, the third oboe player was more virtuosic. Uh, but so, so we, maybe we, we don't worry about that so much. What we worry about is being the most creative. Many of the most interesting orchestras in the 18th century were not in the biggest capitals, they were in smaller towns. You had uh, uh, little towns in Germany and Austria that had magnificent orchestras. Mannheim had one of the, the greatest orchestras uh, around. Salzburg, where Mozart came from, much smaller city than Vienna, but at the time was a more interesting place for music to happen. Anyway, long story short, I've said Louisville Orchestra should be the most creative orchestra on planet Earth. Uh, and that means coming up with a big vision for what we can do. It means creating opportunities where every single year the entire public has a relationship with this orchestra. That's 1.2 million people. It means being the world leader in commissioning new music because you deserve to hear music that was written for you. Beethoven wrote music for people that were alive, not for people that didn't exist yet. It's great that we have Beethoven, but Beethoven wrote it for people that were living at that moment. If the airspace was so filled with Monteverdi and Bach, nobody would have ever asked Beethoven to write anything. You deserve the same. We should be the world leader in commissioning new music. We should be the world leader in presenting concerts in a creative way. That means when you go to the concert hall, this is not a place to sleep, it's not a place to relax, it's a place to see the most stimulating and, and hopefully brilliant creative ways of presenting music. So that it's never just about sitting through a concert. Nobody should ever, bless you, nobody should ever have to sit through a concert. You should be so engaged in every note that you're hearing because we've set it up that way. Orchestras have gotten way too complacent. They have let all kinds of things uh, encroach on the territory of attention. And these days, we have more things that demand our attention than anything else. Phones and work that can be answered and dealt with at any time. We have to cut through that and be ahead of the curve, not behind it by decades. Uh, talking about new halls, we've been working with uh, the, the, the KCA, the Kentucky Center, uh, to, to uh, envision what this incredible new hall at Paristown Point is going to be. I don't know if you're following that, but there are some big, big ideas there about presenting music in a way that Louisville, and honestly, this entire part of the United States has never seen before. And uh, our, our friends over from the Kentucky Center here, I don't, I'm not supposed to divulge anything that, that's not supposed to be divulged, right? But so far, I am telling you that the, that the dreaming on this is world class. This is not something that I've heard a, a lot of when it comes especially to money, kind of what's right for Louisville. Um, I often heard, you know, when I got here that we have to make sure everything is what's right for Louisville. I said, that is the actually the exact opposite. We must think about what's right for the people that live here. That will be what's right for Louisville. Not a budget first, a dream second, a dream first, and the budget and the money and everything else will follow. Because I really think that this city is filled with creative open people. When you hear a good idea, you want it to happen. People want to be on the side of great creative ideas. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, we, we've talked about creating an entire new dynamic with, uh, with JCPS, uh, uh, creating a, a music immersion program in schools that haven't had music before. I mean, things that, that, that other places often just talk about, and these things have already started uh, to happen. A tour of the state of Kentucky. We've talked about using music to break down the urban and rural divide. It's uh, something that I noticed right away when I came here. I came from San Francisco, that's my hometown, where everybody thinks the exact same thing. And I got to Kentucky, I realized, okay, 
well. We have lots of different opinions about how things should, should take place, but there's one thing people, well, two things people seem to like. They like to eat, and they really like music. And music seems to transcend a lot of our differences. Then we have an obligation to use it. It's not good enough to play for the same people that already hear it. We have to take music to people that can be brought together who otherwise wouldn't come together. And so we have the, a, a big vision for what that might mean. And this, these are all things that we're talking about doing in a short order, within a matter of uh, years, and just one or two, not decades. And that is going to be the survival of, of the arts organizations, because to bring it back to, to this question of corporate philanthropy, and I probably have to wrap up at some point, I have no idea. This, in, in rehearsals, somebody comes up and says, you have you know, 30 seconds left. In rehearsals, they tell you, because you, you go two seconds over, that's it for you. But anyway, this brings it back. Corporations and individuals want, you want something to, to essentially grow from the things that you fund. You do not want to buy a single pair of shoes with your donation money. You want to see something that's going to expand and over time blossom something that leverages your giving, something that creates, uh, uh, something that, that, that continues to be alive. And arts organizations must recognize that what we do is living. And so it's almost like by talking about corporate philanthropy, I'm almost just yelling at ourselves. I'm telling us we must do a world-class job of bringing to you the solutions to the problems in society through the arts. And I can tell you this, no city in America yet has decided to put the arts forward. Every city in America, since maybe you know, the, the end of the 19th century in, in New York, when there was a real shot, because there was such extraordinary wealth that was so far beyond anything that anybody could conceive, and there was still land and a lot of socioeconomic factors that made it possible. But since that time, cities lead with everything else and drag the arts along. And you know, Plato envisioned this idea of a philosopher king Nobody has ever really put that into practice, the, the idea that the arts can lead us all. The Medicis came pretty close, but they had too many personal problems. So uh, here we are, here we are in, 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 in the 21st century America, and the reality is this town has a shot at doing that. We actually could be the first city in America to say that, that an arts-led city is a, is a healthy city. It's one where people are communing with each other because it breaks down back backgrounds, it breaks down barriers, it breaks down the things that divide us so quickly. Anybody can have a relationship with music and virtually every single person does. So what I'm saying is in order for this to be that kind of dialogue where the money flows towards the arts and we demonstrate why the arts are, are, are critical, we're going to have to dream this stuff up together. And I think that unlike just you know, errant growth, random growth, this is smart growth. That's something that the whole world will, will look to us and say, look at that, they, they are doing it. They are, are believing in this, this idea of our compassionate city that, that cares about each other, and the artists have come together to, to make that happen. Uh, and I think if we can put that vision in front of you all for what it looks like in five years, 10 years, and 20 years to have a, a first of its kind, best in class city, truly creative city, I think that's something I, I know you'll all get behind. Um, and then it will be far less about fundraising than it will be about building things together. Um, and everybody likes to build something. If it's not an actual building, then this is a, a concept that we're all working towards. And I've seen it happen in, in practice. So that's kind of my, I guess that's my stump speech my, that I'll, I'll, I'll be repeating because I finally hopped on this soapbox here and I believe in the city so much that I'm not going to get off of this soapbox uh, because I think that there is the possibility here that other cities could, could hardly even dream up. It's New York's too far gone to even start having these conversations because the arts groups are so fractured and the economy is so far beyond what happens in the art and the commercial side of it is so much more powerful. We can do it here. Uh, and I think it, it, will, it will make us something that, that we, we're already very, very proud and we should be of our arts, but what we could do would be transformative for, for, for the entire country and society as a whole. I know that sounds like visions of grandeur, but I, well, look at my job. I'm a conductor, so what am I, what, a, what would you expect? Yeah, anyway, so I, I know there were supposed to be some questions, right? <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I guess I have five minutes. 
Oh my God, 10, 10 minutes. Okay, well, I can always play some more music for you too. I can play walk out music. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Oh, oh, there, there's a question line. Oh, yes. Teddy ne Neville Blakemore. Uh, very compelling vision, uh, which you're laying out there, sort of a, an arts-led city. Uh, the Fund for the Arts has gone through a transformation recently, so you know, expanding the pool of access to money. Can you flesh out a little bit further what that would look like? I mean, is it a, is it a policy change? Is it a funding change? Is it a, is it a coalition building? Is it all the above? But what does that look like? How do we get that going question. further? It, it is all of the above. I mean, there are, there are things that we're kind of talking about that are still, I don't know if you, you nothing in the arts world is all that top secret um, because it's, there's, you know, it's not, not nuclear codes, but uh, uh, as far as I know, no artists have those. So uh, th what I would say is, first of all, it is a, it's a, an expanded viewpoint of how the city and region funds art. Uh, first of all, it's going to take a lot of conversations with people that have resources to, to, to make it clear that funding the arts is not a kind of peripheral thing. If your business is in healthcare, if your business is in banking, if your business is in uh, the legal profession, whatever it is, the arts dialogue with all of that. And we need to demonstrate why this vision is good for companies that have become very specific with their giving. One of the major trends in, in corporate philanthropy and even individual philanthropy to some extent is that people are, are much more focused now. Uh, they might say, well, our, our company is a health company or our company is a food company, so it makes a lot of sense to fund those sectors of the nonprofit world. And what we're trying to say is, yes, that's absolutely true, but think about how in, in other places the arts have elevated everything. Think about how an institution like Carnegie Hall helped define New York as a leadership city globally, which ultimately changed it economically and not in a subtle way. Things like that, you take out the theater in New York, you take out Carnegie Hall, you take out Lincoln Center, you take out the galleries in Chelsea, and suddenly do people still want to live, work, and play in New York? Do they want to move their businesses there? Does Google want to put their New York headquarters right next to a place where there's no art, there's none of that energy? And that's the point that we have to keep making, that these are not on the, on the periphery, these are at the core of society. And while we have to solve critical problems like food, housing, uh, uh, access to, to basic education, the arts fit in with all of that because it's the, it has the potential to redefine how people uh, are educated. It has the, the, the ability to redefine how people interact with their city. Do they come downtown? Do they value their downtown? Do they understand the potential of, of the people that live and work amongst them? Uh, so anyway, yes, that, that's, that's a core part of it. And that's on a policy level. That's got to be at the state level, the city level. Uh, and, and then it translates to the foundation level. But what we're working on doing as an arts network is building this kind of model. You know, the way that if I was building a new building, I'd bring in an architectural model and say, as a university, I'm building my new your computer science center. You see it, it looks great. Frank Gehry designed it. You want to get your name on that. It's harder with a conceptual model of the arts, but we have to have it. We have to say, if we created a mega endowment or something like that, if we created a, a situation where the arts had beyond just regular funding and could actually dream creatively, what does that look like on a daily basis? How many free concerts, how many free events I is that? How, how do we redefine uh, our relationship to the education platform uh, in this city? What are those things? And I've been putting together a pretty specific plan. It's my seven-pointed plan uh, uh, to actually show you what that looks like from an orchestra um, and, and how, that, how that translates to, to reality. And I'm, I'm happy to you know, share that um, down the road if you want to take a look because I hope that you can go to your other you know, friends in other cities and say, look what our orchestra is doing. It's a, it should be a point of pride. And uh, so, yeah, absolutely. It's a great, great question. Yes. I'm Judy Hamaker. Thanks for coming. When you were interviewing for a job here, what was the criteria or what attributes of Louisville was it that sold you on coming here rather than maybe taking a job in another city that's bigger like Nashville or Charlotte that might or might not pay you more money? So what, what sold you on Louisville? Well, I don't have a very good personal business sense, so that, the, that never even entered into it. <laughs> I just really like the city, and uh, look, I, I believe that, that my job, um, my job is, is as a, I'm, I, I'm a public servant. I don't see my job, I'm not a, not a professional musician, I don't know what that means, I'm a public servant. Because our orchestra is funded by all of you. 
your donations and your tickets. It's not a product that you need. I'm not selling food, I'm not selling iPhones, I'm, I'm providing a service, so I'm a public servant. I recognized immediately that this is a city where things can actually happen. And this is a city where the potential was great. The last thing you want to go to is a place where the potential is little and the actuality is already vast. You can't make a mark, you can't d define a vision, and you can't build a coalition of people if p the turf has already been claimed. And the amazing thing about Louisville is it had two things. It one had possibility, but more importantly, it had a history uh, with the orchestra specifically of doing things way beyond what people thought was possible. And so people know about the Louisville Orchestra. I can tell you when I got my job, one of the first things shortly after the announcement, John Adams, arguably the most, not the president, the uh, uh, composer, <laughs> arguably the most important living composer, wrote me a note that same day saying, and I, I known him for, for a long time, but he writes me saying, Dear Teddy, I hope you understand what a responsibility this is to take on this organization, even though they had gone through challenging times. They were the reason that he wanted to be a composer growing up because it was the only way to hear uh, world-class contemporary music. It was the only orchestra that was recording those things that had a vision for that. Uh, same thing that happened with uh, Michael Tilson Thomas. When I brought him to conduct the orchestra, he stood on our stage at the Whitney Hall and told the orchestra members in his first rehearsal, he said, I hope you all understand how much musicians out there value this orchestra. Way more than you'd ever think by our budget size, way more than what you would have thought possible back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the orchestra made its mark. And I knew that if a city could, could support it then, they could support it now. And that's, that's all that, that needs to happen um, uh, in order to, to, to fall in love with, with a place. And this is my fifth season now, and I still believe in it just, just as much. Teddy, I'm uh, Dick Bryan, and uh, you answered most of my questions with your vision, but putting a stake in the ground. When my wife and I walk away from the ballet, especially when it's been live music that night, we often tell people that for a city this size, it's the best arts we've ever seen. For a city this size, it's the best. Is that true? Are we there yet? Or We have the talent right now. There's a unique situation where the leaders in the arts sector are all very friendly with each other. They talk to each other. I can tell you the New York Philharmonic doesn't collaborate with the New York City Ballet and they play, they're not across the street from each other, they're across from a fountain. That's, that's as far as they are. Here, we talk all the time. All, all the arts leaders get together and talk about their shared vision. Partly because we have to, but also because that's smart. You should get the best of all of us when we use our minds together to think big not little silos where each person is concerned about their donors and their money and their budgets. It's too small still. So I would say there are two things. Yes, the talent level is off the charts. Uh, the kind of people, we had 120 people, I think 130 people auditioned for one tuba spot in the Louisville Orchestra last week. We had 75 show up because we had to get rid of 70 of them. We couldn't have them all come. We, it's just too many tubas unless there's a convention. And uh, <laughs> we, we ultimately chose just one, whittled down from that. That, and the same thing had happened at second violin auditions. We had five people that qualified for the job. We, that's never happened. It means that things are absolutely growing and it's a brilliant time, but it has to grow faster. We are, we're outpaced in terms of, of money and arts dollars. The entire arts network, throw them all together. Orchestra, Speed Museum, Actors Theater, put the Fraser in, throw, I mean, throw more, K-Mac, uh, uh, ballet, opera, let's throw them all in. Does not even equal the budget of just the Cleveland Orchestra by itself. And I'm not saying we necessarily want an orchestra so expensive that, you know, that it, that it makes it hard to actually exist every single year, although it still is hard to exist every single year at this size, but, but that's too small for Louisville. We have the ability to scale this up and you get the best bang for your buck. An extra thousand dollars in Cleveland doesn't get you anything with, with the orchestra of that size. It doesn't do anything. In this city, I can do wonders with even small amounts of money that, that go towards a creative project, we could turn that into magic. And that's what makes Louisville so special right now that we can spin magic uh, in the most creative and inventive ways and all the arts leaders are thinking alike. So it's, it's kind of both. Yeah, so I think, I think I reached my time limit. Thank you Rotarians for everything you do for our community. I know I'm preaching to the converted as they say. So, 
just uh, thank you so much for having me, and, and good luck with all your wonderful things that you're doing. Thank you. Teddy, thank you. Let's give it up one more time. Let's, uh, let's also uh, celebrate Kenny G and the uh, Speakers Committee. They, you guys are batting a thousand. All right, don't forget Craig Sherman, what is Rotary in the back of the room, and we are adjourned. <laughs>